I want to thank everyone for an the invitation. I look forward to presenting a lesson. I am happy to worship with you this morning. Before I begin, I want to request, if we can, if it is acceptable at the end of worship, uh, to uh, allow you to ask any questions of me, uh, introduce you to my family as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get into the lesson of the hour. I have chosen the text from Acts, the 17th chapter, and we're going to look at an aspect of evangelism. And we can look at many texts in the New Testament to explain what evangelism looks like, what it should be, etc. And I want to stress this, that any methodology, anything that we do in regard to teaching the lost, it must, it must be framed according to the New Testament pattern. And therefore, I think, and I believe very strongly, that the book of Acts is my perfect guy. If I can see how the New Testament teachers of the gospel worked, then I too, I believe, can do the same thing. And so, I will impress upon us this very fact. When we see Paul, before he gets to Athens, we see a man that was beaten down nearly. You would think he would be too discouraged to even hold his head up. Remember in Thessalonica, the experience he had. He had to be whisked out of town. Jason was beaten on his behalf. He goes to Berea. He had great reception there. However, the Jews from Thessalonica were so bent on destroying him that they went all the way to Berea in order to try to kill him. That is how terrible his experience was. And so then he goes to what? A pagan city? A very religiously pagan city. One that would be mocking and ridicule and just maybe as if I understand it correctly, this Epicurean and Stoic philosopher's uh, Areopagus was also a courtroom of which they could try him or charge him uh, for the preaching of a strange God or a deity that they did not know. It sounds to me like it might have been easier for him to just lay his head low, to not raise it up, spend his time maybe in the synagogue, and then just wait for his companions to come. But he does not. He goes out there and he preaches the gospel. He preaches in the marketplace, of which he had the privilege, especially in this very religious city. And by the way, from what I understand, Athens had once been a great commercial city, but it has kept its prominence among the collegiate and the spiritual class. Therefore, this was a common religious circle. He spent his time in teaching and preaching, especially among elite people, people who had knowledge, certainly in foreign gods, but they had a great deal of knowledge. He was definitely going to be challenged. So let us examine what Paul does in this, in this uh, city. First of all, we notice in verse 16 that his spirit was provoked in him. Think about that, friends. His spirit was provoked in him because he saw the gods of the city, and he saw how they had been given over to them. He was stirred. He was spurred on. He was stimulated. How often are we really stirred to really work? We live in very godless places, don't we, generally speaking. I don't care whether you live in the rural communities of today in the Middle East, Midwest or the East, or you live in the big cities of the East and West Coast. I realize there are degrees uh, of sin that we may experience and see around us, but nonetheless, we live in a society that is given over really to idolatry, a worship of self, a worship of things. We've got social unrest. We've got a host of issues to deal with. And the fact of the matter is, Sometimes, and maybe too often, our spirits are not really provoked. I'm afraid that we do not blush over sin anymore. And most importantly, it doesn't stir us to work. It doesn't stir us to teach. It doesn't stir us to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul was that way. And so the first lesson of evangelism that I say that we need to learn is we need to decide whether we're on the Lord's side, if we're really interested in his cause, if we really are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then why aren't we provoked in our spirit? We got to sharpen our tools. We've got to be prepared for the fight, but we have to be engaged as Paul was. Paul wasn't going to be discouraged by the conflict that he's had. He's not going to be discouraged because he's being chased from city to city. He may be away from the traditional Jewish conflict, but he has certainly entered into the lion's den when it comes to the Gentile conflict. And so the question will be, what will we do in our very place, in our very time? There are things that we can do to change our methodology, I am sure. There are things that we may need to do from time to time to modify. And we certainly need to be careful and wary of, uh, of dangers that are there. 
but we must be a provoked people in a positive way. We must be a stirred up people. We must be spurred on. These things that we see around us should dishearten us. And even, yes, even anger us to say, the God of heaven knows what is best for us. Why can't you see it and do our best? The second thing that we need to see is that he also was a reasonable person. In other words, what I mean by that is he would be one who would reason. He realized in the synagogue that there were Gentile and Jewish people of disparate understandings of the scripture, and they certainly, he had the gospel of Jesus Christ. He had the story of the resurrection of the dead. They needed that. And so he was stirred, as we've seen. He is stirred to reason. We have to be a prepared people. It will not do us any good if we're not reading, if we're not studying and meditating on the Word, and if we're not preparing ourselves. One of the things that uh, will cause us sometimes difficulty is to realize how much work there really is in teaching someone else. Oftentimes we're hesitant, we're scared. Maybe it's a family member or friend, and we, we know what their response may be. And so we're, we're not going to go out there and stick our necks out, as we say, because we're afraid. But I would suggest to you, before we get to the fear factor, that we can overcome that if we are preparing ourselves. The simple message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that's what we need to be able to preach. That's what souls need. I'm not saying that we don't need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and that we have much more to learn, but I will suggest to you that our first aim as evangelists to the world will be to be prepared to teach them the saving message of Jesus Christ. And friends, all of us can be equipped for that. And we need to be prepared to reason with them on that level. It doesn't mean we have to know all the answers. Sometimes we won't. Sometimes we'll be maybe poorly equipped. And sometimes we have to humble ourselves and say, I don't know that answer. I will get back with you. Let us study these things out. Let's try to discover this. Maybe I have someone who can help me with that answer. And you know what? It'll go a long way toward their respect of you, their appreciation of your true passion and interest in the gospel of Jesus Christ when you don't know it all. Sometimes we get ourselves into trouble, and I'll have to admit, in times past, especially in my youth, I would put myself in dangerous positions because I would argue over nothing. I would eventually get to the point where it was futile. I would try to argue those things that I wasn't so clear on. While I had some clarity, it wasn't enough, and it led me down a deep, dark pit. And I didn't help anybody, and I certainly didn't help the person that needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us be a reasoning people. And the God, the, 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 the Word of God is a book to be reasoned with. It is not a book that it just simply has the dictates to do or to not do. And furthermore, it's, we know it's more than just feeling and emotion. It is one that we sit down and we decide we're going to look and examine what God wants from us and what he wants for us to do in our lives before him, whether it be in worship or service, let us be a reasoning people. Paul did that and he would continue on. Furthermore, we need to be willing to teach despite what other people think. Notice that he says that they were, that he was charged or it says that he was charged with being a babbler. What that really means was is that he really is got nothing to say. He really has nothing of value or worth to hear, that he's just saying things off the top of his head, maybe. He's an uneducated man, and that would also be spurred on by people who thought they knew it all, and sometimes we'll run across that, and that will be challenging. We have to make sure that we're prepared to overcome that. Sometimes we're afraid of people because we know what they're going to tell us. They're going to charge us with things like this. They may mock us, they may ridicule us, and therefore we're not prepared because we're afraid of their response. If that's all that they do to us, then that is, that is enough for us to continue to fight the good fight, isn't it? Why should we care? They're not taking our lives. They're not taking our jobs, our monies. Those things may occur sometime in our life, but I'll tell you this much. At this point in our life, when we are preaching the gospel, if they, all they have to say to us is you have nothing to say, then at least we know we have done our job. Let us not be scared away. Some people will have poor motives when they approach us. Maybe they have poor motives when they agree to study the Word of God. Have you ever studied with uh, a Jehovah Witness? Have you ever studied with a Mormon? And these are maybe the extreme cases, and certainly the Pentecostal as well. Oftentimes, they will have other agendas or other ideals. We know that. We understand that. 
Why should that scare us away from the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why should that cause us not to teach that pure message and to be willing to handle it aright? Furthermore, we need to make sure that we understand that we must not be ashamed of the gospel. That comes in different ways. In fact, I will suggest to you first that we may think that we're not ashamed simply because we worship God, that we come together in assemblies like this and we worship with our fellow saints, that we're not really ashamed. But we know that when it comes to our coworker, maybe even our brother or sister, our mother or our father, that we're not willing to teach them the message of Jesus Christ. Maybe we know their prejudices. Maybe they're Baptist in faith. Maybe they, 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 they have something against members of the church. A host of reasons may cause us to be ashamed in little degrees as well as in great degrees. I can remember a time in which I was very intimidated by people who had ed great educations, that I was concerned about their abilities and knowledge, and therefore I was ashamed to present them. This humble gospel message would be beneath them, and that was something I needed to overcome, because the gospel is indeed for all. It doesn't matter which class of people. Maybe you're ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because uh, you're afraid that, that you may be exposed for your error. Maybe it's somebody you know very close to you. And what I mean to say is not your error in the gospel, but maybe you have things undone. Maybe there are things you need to repent of, and you're not willing to address those things. It's much like the moat that is in your eye, the beam, you see. The beam is much greater, isn't it, than that little speck. And that beam needs to be addressed, doesn't it? And so I would suggest take care of that sin and then press on. But again, we need to identify. We need to be examining ourselves. The so Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter, bears that out plainly, that we, to te we are to test ourselves to see whether or not we are really faithful before God or not. We cannot be ashamed. For Paul says, I am not ashamed, in Romans, the uh, first chapter, that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is a power. It's a powerful message that will save man's soul. It doesn't matter what walk of life. It doesn't matter what their education is, their race. It doesn't matter what country they're from. It is the saving message. It's that glad tidings. And friends, a part of our evangelistic effort has to be our enthusiasm for that and not our shamefastness against it. We must be discerners. That means that we have to see our prospective student for who they are. We need to try to understand who they are and strive our best to, to, to approach them in the way that would be most appropriate. Now that takes more homework, doesn't it? It's a little more difficult. Well, we'll notice what Paul perceives going back to our text. He says very plainly that they are, sorry, I'm in the wrong one. In Acts chapter 17 and in verse 22, he says, as he stood in the midst of the Areopagus, in their midst, he says, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. The point is that God, I mean, that Paul understood his audience, that he understood that they were religious. Now, they may have taken it as an acceptance of them. It may, they may have just accepted it as flattery. And I want to suggest to you, we do not flatter. We don't need to give uh, empty praises or praises that are not worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But to the extent that we observe something that is connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ or can be a, a teaching moment in respect to the gospel of Jesus Christ, use it and use it wisely. Be honest. He wasn't dishonest when he says, I perceive that you are religious. For all men appear to have some type of religion. I would argue even the atheists, that's a religion, that they are religious people, and so on and so forth. And so we understand that there are religions uh, that we may be able to use to help teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So to recognize or to acknowledge somebody's religious fervor, their spirit in there, does not say that we approve of their actions. It simply allows us the opening opportunity. They are willing to allow us in. Hopefully we will be able to sit down with them and study the word of God and learn it together so that they may come to the truth, the knowledge of the salvation of the soul through the blood of Jesus Christ. Again, be discerners. Again, it also takes work. So therefore, we better be Bible students. 
We must be, as Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, rightly handling the word of God in that latter part because we've got to be diligent in this work. And so friends, let us do so. Another thing that we can learn from this text in evangelism is not be afraid. We talked about that before. And really, that really seems to be a lot of our problem, that we're afraid of what someone's going to say to us. We understand that they don't agree in some way. Maybe we know them well enough to know some of their faith beliefs, their beliefs, that is, and their religious faith. Therefore, we cannot let that get in the way. Sometimes we're afraid to teach because we know they're ignorant of the truth. Well, that word is a negative word in our modern context. But initially, as we understand, it just seem, means somebody who does not know. That's what the meaning is. And so he understood, he perceived their ignorance and was able to work with that. And really, that helped some. Because someone who actually does not know what they need to know are a good candidate, more often than not, than those who seem that they already know, that they're full of themselves. Paul says in the Roman letter in chapter 12 that we are not to be high-minded, to think too much of ourselves. Wasn't that the problem of the religious leaders of Jesus' day? They thought too much of themselves. They thought they already had the pathway to salvation through the law, through the being children of Abraham. That's the argument in Galatians chapter 3 and 4. They thought that they were saved because of Abraham's being Abraham's seed. And so a binding circumcision was sufficient to them. Paul says we will have none of that. You are adoptive sons. If you are sons according to faith and you are sons of Abraham, you're buried in the water of baptism. You put on Christ is what he says. And so therefore, let us not be afraid of what someone, of, of someone's ignorance. With their ignorance, their not knowing can help us. Again, in verse 23, therefore the one who you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. We might say it this way. I understand you believe in Jesus. Have you examined this about him? All right. And you know that the moment that you discuss the element of Jesus that you know they don't believe in, you've started with their basis of ignorance, right? And you understand that. But in a very kind way, you should be able to lead them to an understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ by doing that. Now, this takes a lot of work. It takes some time and effort on our part. We may not get it perfect always, but we still need to strive. And Paul showed us the way. He was invited to a hostile environment, technically. Though these people invited him there, he knew that they did not like him. Some commentaries will say that this was a legal court. I don't believe, though it may be the court in which they would uh, decide the matter of religion or the matter of what could be taught, that he was on trial. They certainly wanted to hear the new things from him. That is for sure. But what's to say that it wouldn't have turned into a dangerous situation for him? That he had to be bold, as we've said in his reproach. He cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now he's going to call them on the carpet. He's going to expose their ignorance. And that's going to be a challenging task. Friends, that's what we have before us. When we sit down with our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, our family members, we're laying before them the fact that Jesus Christ died for their sins, and though they may believe in something about that or an aspect of that, does not mean that they understand that as they should. That means they're unknowing. That means we might say rightly that they are ignorant. Again, I would be careful, especially in the modern context, to use that word because what people think of it, but it is still true just the same that we cannot be afraid to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ just because we know our audience believes something different or does not know what we're getting ready to teach them. Furthermore, we must be evoked with logical thinking. We've kind of addressed that when we talked about our reasoning, our, our willingness to reason the gospel of Jesus Christ, reason with it. But we must be evoked into logical thinking. Notice, and we must encourage that in others. Notice what Paul observes in our text in verse 28. He says in verse 28 that for him, in him, he says, we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, 
Since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devices. In the third century BC, I understand that there was a poet, I think his name is Eratus, or, and, and that may not be correct, a Greek poet who had made a proclamation. Now, of course, he is referring to Zeus, but he does believe that it's in this divine being that we have our movement, our being, and our life. So he was acknowledging an eternal truth, though he had the wrong God in mind. Now, they had modified and changed over time, and obviously they're talking about gods that reside in these temples. But think about it. We're asking someone to be logical. Ask the simple question, like in their case, is it indeed possible that the God that, that is mighty and powerful, that created all things, who holds the salvation, your salvation, that is, in your hand, could actually be contained in some human structure, whatever that may be? And if you do do that, maybe you'll just, again, provoke the thoughts and the, the meditation of the heart about this matter. You need to encourage logical thinking by your logical approach. The Bible is a very logical book. Though there is much that is supernatural, there is much that is done by faith that we have to believe because we have not experienced, we cannot see with our naked eye. There is plenty of evidence to show those facts to be true. For faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We've got to be prepared. Sometimes it's difficult to see these things, but we need to be able to encourage someone to say, now, a God that is so great and mighty, why would he do this, that, or the other that they may believe? Why wouldn't he be greater than you and beyond even your own comprehension in many ways? And he certainly would defy the physical elements or the human nature. He would have to be much greater than that. Again, people hold on to these things very tightly and closely. And even our religious friends who believe in Christianity have types of materialism, for sure, certainly idolatry. Even the Lord's people sometimes, again, move themselves into the idolatrous practices around them in various ways. We don't have to erect a God, an icon, in our houses or in our cars or in our workplaces or wherever to be idolatrous. We have worship of self, as I said before, worship of things, worship of success, worship of prestige, worship of pride, and so on and so forth. But we've got to be prepared to be logical thinkers. We must evoke that in others as well. And that's what Paul is doing. This is the process of evangelism. What about to teach? For what reason? What is the end? What is our end goal? Why do we teach? We want the salvation of the soul, I hope. I look back sometimes at some of the studies I've had that devolved into arguments that really led nowhere of useless character. And I understood the one thing that I missed was that I did not stay focused on the purpose. In other words, why do I sit down and study with you? Assuming you are not a Christian, what is my aim? Is it to argue about things in the Bible? I may have to address some things. We may talk about them. We can study them. I don't want to discourage that. But at the same time, those things that do not matter to the salvation of the soul need to be left on the back burner, and I need to stay focused. I have grown better at that over the years. I've realized that this is really what it's all about. This is who Paul is. He's not going to dispute with them. In fact, we'll notice that it appears that he's not going to be able to finish his talk, his discussion, because he's going to discuss the resurrection of the dead, and they're going to stop their ears, so to speak. They're done, and they're going to end up in an argumentation, and he's going to leave or depart from them. He says in verse 29, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, and something shaped by art, a man's devising, but notice, truly this time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. He's calling them to repent. If my lesson doesn't end with a call to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, then what good is it? If my lesson does not lead to that, what good is it? That's really the, good, the important question. So repent, because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who is ordained. And he has given assurance of this by, or this to all by raising him from the dead. 
Christ is going to return. There's going to be a day of judgment. Now, what am I involved in? What is my, where, where are my energies? What, what is, where's my time spent? I do a lesson series on the economy of a Christian. And one of the primary things that we need to learn is that we all have usefulness to God. We have our time, we have our opportunities, we have our money, we have our abilities. How are we using those? To what extent are we using them for ourselves or are we using them for others? Again, he called them to repent. Every lesson needs to be designed to call the alien sinner, though the one who is without Christ, to the obedience of the gospel. So we also not be, need not be concerned about ourselves. Um, that we get too, again, worried about what people think of us, and we get so caught up in how they're going to respond to us, and so we're worried about that negative reaction. So it causes us a lot of times just to stop. We don't even start. We don't even go there. We, we, will, we will step forward, and then we will think, what are they going to say? Maybe we even have an idea of what they might say. Then we get scared and we back away. We can't do that. What did they do? Do you think Paul went up to the Areopagus thinking that he was going to get a bunch of people that was absolutely interested in everything that he said? Not necessarily. It's possible. He was hopeful. We all should be hopeful. And maybe he didn't know his audience all that well personally, but I believe he knew them spiritually. Remember, this is a learned man himself. Paul is not ignorant of these things. And so though they want to come up there and hear, or they want him to come up there to speak, he knows what might be the response because they're not any less arrogant or less, any less prideful than his own people. Notice with me in verse 31, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. See, some would say that maybe, and it's possible, that they were just inquisitive, but they hadn't fully evolved in that and they wanted to hear him again, that they were just putting him off for the time being. Others have suggested that what they mean by that is that they were dismissive of him, just as they shut their ears over the resurrection. I don't know which it is, but I do know this. We could be overly concerned about these things. Can we be mocked? Sure. Could we be ridiculed? Yes. I've had those experiences, but I've never had anybody beat me yet. Nobody's jailed me yet. Nobody's done anything to harm my physical body or my property or my family. Again, let us not be overly concerned. Let us not even be concerned, I should say, about how people are going to respond. It is God who decides to give the increase. As we see in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, our job is to water and to plant. So there are three important things that we must understand about the outcome of our work. Our goals, our, our uh, agenda, if you will, what should we seek? First of all, that the Word of God is taught. The Word of God, if it is indeed living and powerful, Hebrews, the fourth chapter and verse 12, if it is indeed profitable for teaching or reproof and correction, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, then we've got to teach it. The Word is powerful. God will find a messenger to preach it, but if it lays on our table, if it lays on our desk, if it lays by our nightstand, if it's only seen in the hallowed halls of the assembly of the saints, then it ain't good enough. The Word of God is good enough. But from our perspective, it ain't. Because the bottom line is, it's got to be taught. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's the great commission that Jesus gave his apostles. Now, we may not be responsible for traveling all over the world, but we are responsible where we're at. And there are opportunities that we have with the people that we know. And I have thoughts about that. And I have plans about that. But those are just methods. The word of God must be taught. It will not have an effect on the soul unless we teach it. We need to be preachers. As Paul says in Romans, the 10th chapter, how are they going to hear unless you preach, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and 17. And souls will decide. Notice here in our text, Paul departed from them. However, some men did join and believed. Well, we know that some decided, as we see at the end, to actually listen, to obey. Maybe sometime after. We don't know the time frame. But there had come, they had come to the conclusion what Paul said was reasonable, was true. And they come to believe it by faith, and they obeyed it, even among the judging class. But we've already read. They mocked and ridiculed. Many more probably did. Therefore, souls will decide. 
In John, the fifth chapter, verses 28 and 29, Jesus paints a picture of, what, of a resurrection scene, and he says, some will have a resurrection to life. But you see, the problem is, some, and maybe even many more, as we see in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 13, 14, is that we will have those who have a resurrection to condemnation. Souls will decide. It ain't up to us. Our job is to preach the word. Our job isn't to make the person believe. And I think sometimes we miss those points and we, we think we've got to. And I can remember times when I tried to force the subject to the point that it was exhausting and I got nowhere because I just determined that if I said it a little bit better, if I just said that one pricking word, just maybe they will listen. No, friends, souls will decide. Our job is to plant into water. And finally, souls will be added. Acts 2 and verse 47, the Lord adds daily to the church being saved. And of course, you and I, you and I will have to be the effective tools. We're the evangelist in order for people to hear the word so that the Lord may, be at, the Lord may add them. Now, they'll have to decide at what point they will join with what members, the saints, wherever, but the Lord adds them to his church, the one that is founded in heaven, the one that is eternal, the one that contains those that have gone on as well as those who remain. As we see in Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 18 and 19, the Lord said he would build his church and the gates of Haiti shall not prevail against it. Are we going to be evangelist? Are we going to mimic or imitate what Paul did? We can. We can do it in our very place that we live. And we can understand that these methods will work just as much as they did then. Why? Bottom line is human nature hasn't changed, has it? The human response mechanisms. The word certainly has not changed for it is eternal. And it saved men, the, that, the way that it saved men that day that Paul spoke in Athens is the same that it will save them today. Technology hasn't changed that. Modernity hasn't changed that. Even postmodernism hasn't changed that. And nothing will change that, for it is the eternal word. We've got to believe it. Do you believe it? I want to encourage you to think about these things. And I want to also encourage you, if you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you do so. Get with the good brethren there and say, this is what I need to do. Help me facilitate this. You need to repent of your sins. You need to confess Jesus as the Christ. And you need to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. If you've studied these things, you've looked at them, you've examined it, you know what you need to do. Why not? Why not now? And if you need the prayers of the congregation, please, please ask. Effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we need to come together often to do this. Maybe you brought reproach upon the church. Maybe you need to ask for the prayers of the congregation because of these things. Then do so, please. We're not here to judge or condemn. Our job is to preach the message, embrace you when you return, love you, help you, work with you, and aid one another. Because the church's aim, aside from coming together to worship the, the Lord, our Savior, to give praise and glory and honor to Him, is to keep the saved saved. Do you realize that that's what you find time and again? Paul says, edify, edify, edify. It's for edification's sake. We are to keep one another built up. We consider these things. I thank you again.